Howdy. Salutations. Hi. Yo. What up? Kyle was making fun of me for my, my greetings. He's like, yo, yo, yo. He, he thought that sounded like me. And I took offense to that. But it's okay. We're back for the Wrestling for MMA podcast. Um, UFC 250 happened, so we're going to be talking about that. And I have a good little bunch of listener questions that we're going to get to. I really like listener questions because this podcast is so ill-defined. It really helps me uh, fill some space there. So I appreciate that, everybody who sends in questions, even the non-serious ones. So... Let's get to it. I just want to go, uh, you know, up and down the list for UFC 250, talk about things. Obviously, we'll be talking about Aljamain Sterling, and we'll be talking about Cody Stamen. Uh, Stamen's the subject of my article this week, and Sterling was the subject of my article last week, so definitely got to talk about that. There were some other, you know, semi-remarkable wrestling moments that happened, but otherwise, I think that those are the main, the main things I want to talk about. Uh, depressing event for some. Uh, definitely a Sun Tzu getting knocked out was sad because that didn't really uh, didn't really reflect the dynamic of the fight. You know the way it ended, it was kind of we call that a mean finish where I'm from. Basically, Garbrandt just did something ridiculous and it worked, but there was thought behind it. It just I don't know. It, it was definitely a little disappointing based on the way the fight was trending. Not to say Sun Tzu was taking over, it just I don't think Garbrandt had quite established that that was a high percentage. <laughs> way to win but nonetheless he won and Osun Sao is never going to get respect ever so that's a little sad and Corey Sandhagen losing is a little sad just because you know we're tight with Elevation Fight Team he's been looking really good I really respect what he does uh, as a striker and, and scrambler and grappler and all of that uh, so he's a really cool guy to have around but this division is crazy tough uh, most of my favorite fighters in the UFC right now are bantamweights so there's a reason for that okay up and down the card uh, Herbert Burns and Evan Dunham. I don't think I'm qualified <laughs> to discuss that back take, but uh, if you want to get a breakdown on that, Herbert actually talked to Michael Fidel, our buddy, over at the Body Lock and broke it down in his interview with him. So if you want to hear it from Herbert, I recommend doing that. Devin Clark, Alonzo Menefield. Uh, this was a tough, tough fight for both guys. Uh, neither are very clean strikers, and Menefield. Uh, once he was on the back foot and, and ran out of steam a little bit, was having some trouble. Clark, I was really impressed with his conditioning because of the way he was wrestling. It was super inefficient and really taxing and not the way that I would recommend to wrestle in MMA, but he kept doing it. He did get one or two uh, takedowns off of that. I think most of the, the takedowns he completed off the straight-on shot attempts from space was him coming up off the shot into body lock and upper body positions and then, you know, dragging or getting to rear standing, what have you, from there. So that's effective, but there are more efficient ways, less dangerous ways to get to those positions. But, you know, it's... He won, so I can't be that critical. Uh, but yes, yeah, shooting straight on, even, even though Menafield's hands were up, so, you know, the hands weren't really part of the defensive equation... He didn't create any movement, any momentum, any expectation. He just kind of, you know, gave a little, a little look, like, you know, a little faint, something like that, and then shot, you know, straight in on the legs and straight, just fully straight. So he didn't turn the corner. Uh, he didn't really have any, any footwork-based finish on the straight-on shots. So he was expecting probably to blow him in a field over, which I'm sure with the legs on him that that works more often than it did in this fight, which was zero times. Uh, but yeah, this was that was not the best look here. But eventually he was able to get to some wrestling situations from that. But honestly, anything where it's like, yeah, this could you know, make you tired and get you in trouble, but eventually it'll work. I don't like that. I think you should be conserving your energy in fights uh, if you can. It, it just, I don't know. He would have he would have done better if he wasn't as tired. But anyway, that's that's still a good a good win for for a light heavyweight. It wasn't too bad. Uh, Alex Perez and Juicy Formiga did not wrestle. Much to my disappointment, because these are two of my favorites in the UFC. And it uh, was basically fairly even, except for Perez hacking at his leg, hacking at his calf with those low leg kicks. This isn't about wrestling, but just, you know, put it out there. A lot of my friends, a lot of the analysts that I'm talking to, 
hate the low leg kicks because basically they think it's, you know, cheese and that it wouldn't actually work if people knew how to check leg kicks, which is, you know, turning your leg outward and, and checking out instead of checking up. A lot of fighters check up. If you check up, your calf's still there to be kicked. If you check out, you've turned your shin towards the kick, uh, which is, that is the way to check it. That's not opinion-based, that's factual. But I guess opinions differ about how cheesy it is and you know how it should or shouldn't be working just based on stance and reaction time things of that nature so it's not cut and dry this is oh a revolutionary technique it could be solved by a pretty minor defensive adjustment but it might be easier said than done just based on the way the rest of the fight's going that being said sometimes it is literally just you know you need to check this differently (laughs) uh so it was a nice little note there but yeah sad for juicy a formiga who i love and wrote three articles about but I'm not going to mourn him too long. Um, Aki Pitolo and Charles Bird, I I think he finished him with an Osoto Gari. I think he had like a, a Russian or something on, on his left arm and he outside tripped him off of it. That was wild. Uh, yeah, I didn't really pay much attention to that fight, but I'm pretty sure he was either rocked before the throw, maybe with an elbow, but then he finished him right after. So Charles Bird, uh, I actually really like him and he's like a good concepts boxer and he's pretty athletic like he knows uh you know to work the body and you know had a boxing game he clearly he clearly worked it more than a lot of fighters do especially at middleweight uh but his he was a bit older Uh, he's from that um i believe he's fortis fortis mma those guys those are guys are all really competent and uh, have some good ideas and, and good overall levels of skill across domains uh, yeah, I think he was like a team leader and it was just a little bit older. His durability isn't quite there. You saw that against Edmund Shabazian. He's got a meme elbowed off his takedown attempt. So sad. Pour one out for Charles Bird. Uh, Cody Stamen versus Brian Kelleher. So I don't want to take up too much time on this just because it's going to be the article and, and you can read it there. But the, the gist of what I really liked out of Cody Stamen's performance was that it wasn't really a wrestling performance, but everything he did as a striker made me really confident about him moving forward as a wrestler. And the majority of that is that he clearly understood level changing, and I think that's going to pay off big time moving forward. Uh, what I mean by that is, like, in a wrestling match, if you want to double-leg someone, you need to get them straight in their stance, you need to get them thinking upper level, not about their hips and legs. Uh, and usually that's done with hand fighting and level changing on the outside, shot fakes, stuff like that, getting them occupied. And then once you get that reaction, then you shoot under. Or let's say you snap them down, then when they're coming back up, then you shoot under. Those are all pretty typical entries for a wrestling match. For a fight, you have to, you know, punch and kick, obviously. So Stamen is, first of all, he's in this this nice, uh, you know, fainty, fainty rhythm. Like his motion overall is very, uh, you know, short level changes, nothing really dramatic uh, and faints. And he, he reminded me a lot of Chad Mendes on the outside, actually like a Chad Mendez impersonation, impression. It wasn't quite there yet with, with depth, but I think the overall idea is like a lot of parries, a lot of feints, uh, you know, a lot of shifting <laughs> entries, which, you know, I don't love. Um, but yeah, it, it was very uh, it was very team alpha male, which is funny because Joseph Benavidez was in his corner. I think he's been training with, with those guys for a while. So that's probably where that came from. Even though he's originally a Darren Crookshank guy, he's out from Michigan. So the karate influence or taekwondo or whatever his background is tma is is still there uh but yeah you saw that level changing and he did plenty of you know one one level entries where he was just storming forward all headshots uh and, and they were okay they were okay but you know i like to see diversity of levels in your attack and eventually it started coming he was body jabbing single body jabbing or you know body jabbing coming up at the two or uh you know straight straight to the body entry stuff like that just Closing distance while changing levels. That's the name of the game, right? If you want to take a leg attack, you're going to have to close distance and change levels. So if you can give them a look that looks like you doing that, but it's something different, they're going to react to it. Uh, and, and it really depends on how they how they react to those things. And Brian Kelleher is kind of a, a high guard, forearm guard type of guy. So statement targeting the body, first of all, was great because they were landing. They landed every time. He just wasn't super comfortable with it. I think it's kind of new. To him, which is understandable. But yeah, I, d- I think that's going to be really helpful moving forward because you saw in that fight, he was building upon it. Uh, he was showing the level change and then he was coming back up or he was hitting the body and coming back up or, you know, coming high and then coming low, things like that. 
he built the level changing work into layered situations. So, uh, you know, Kelleher would enter off a straight and Stamen was actually slipping uh, and hitting short pivots. Not, not beautiful, you know, perfect, but short pivots. So he was still in position to throw and then hitting the body uh, and coming back up. And that was beautiful. So he has some really good stuff drilled into him. And you can definitely drop off those uh, body attacks into uh, leg attacks, which is something Rashad Evans did a couple of times, especially against Rampage Jackson. You saw that. Um, just, you know, there's a lot to like there. I don't think he wrestled as much in this fight because of it was, it was relatively short notice for him. So he's fighting up a weight class, and I think he wanted to conserve his energy. The big uh, elephant in the room with this fight is that Stamen's brother died about a week ago, a week before the fight, uh, his 18-year-old brother. It was, it was very unexpected. So first of all, that's horrible. And I believe his explanation was that his brother was his biggest fan and, and would have wanted to see him compete and see it through, which is really admirable. I mean, you have to be a, a different kind of person to do anything in that state, let alone, let alone have the performance of your career. He was super focused the whole time. He kept a crazy pace. And as soon as the fight ended, he broke down and started crying, which I think I hit a lot of people pretty hard. And then his interview, he, you know, it was super emotional. So yeah, you can't not like Cody Stamen after this. I think any criticisms of him before this about his top game is very uh, stagnant. He wasn't really a good passer and maybe didn't have the confidence to posture up and throw. I don't really care. <laughs> as long as there's a couple other good things about your game that, that can get you by. I don't mind, especially if you're going to be winning decisions uh, with you know, a couple minutes of top control time, even if it's not actually controlling, not really doing anything. If the judges see it, I don't mind, especially if you're somebody who has a limited gas tank, which is not a, a sin. Um, I would certainly be tired if I fought like that. But yeah, I was really happy with Cody Stamen's performance. When he did get takedowns, it was off of Kelleher's kicks. I think that's probably not a good look for him moving forward just because he was waiting for them. He was eating a, a decent amount of kicks. And the way he was catching them was he was uh, you know, dipping off his jabs, which is great. But he's dipping off his jabs and lowering his other hand to catch the kicks. He was bringing his hand down. Uh, and Kelleher never went high, but he should have. So that, that wasn't great. But otherwise, I, I really liked everything else. And I like Brian Kelleher too. He's got a nice guillotine, which I think might be another reason why Stamen didn't take as many leg attacks. He just didn't want to deal with that whole part of the game and did a great job uh, applying a decent amount of pressure. Had, had some really slick defensive looks in the back foot. Not the whole fight, but sometimes, which is all you need starting out. I think it'll, it'll become more consistent as he goes. And yeah, I'm really excited to see more out of him moving forward. I definitely have my eye on him. I declare him officially good. And uh, yeah, big, big ups to Cody Stamen. And read that article when it comes out. I don't know if it'll be out before or after this, so just keep your eyes peeled. Uh, Ian Heinish knocked out Gerald Mearshart, and uh, yeah, that happened. Okay, Alex Caceres, Chase Hooper. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about that. Sean O'Malley knocked out Eddie Wineland. That was sad. I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, Neil Magny and and. Tony Martin, who is now Anthony Rocco Martin. I forget why he did that. I think it was like to be to be closer to his, his father, to be further from his father. Something to do with a family member who he shares the name with or, or to not be like him. He might be like Tony Martin Jr. and he changed it. I should, really should have looked that up before I supposed the meaning. But in this fight, uh, Rocco Martin... It was probably the cleaner boxer, a uh, cleaner striker overall, and, and a great grappler. And if he did, you know, get top position more consistently, that probably would have been a good avenue for him. What happened here is that he kept clinching with Neil Magny, and Neil Magny is very hard to clinch with. Very strong, great cardio, going to wear on you, and it just didn't work out for Martin. And by the third round, he was pretty tired, and they kept clinching, and it just wasn't a great look for, for Rocco Martin. So... My, my only thoughts on this, I didn't study it super closely, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I believe that Martin was a little overzealous on his entries into to closing the distance. Just when you're fighting a guy like that who has all that reach on you, he's so tall, it can be really difficult to measure how far forward you have to move to, to land. And I think he got a little skittish 
and overcommitted to his entries and ended up crashing in and clinching a lot. Um, I think overall he, he just looked kind of nervous and a little out of sorts and was pushing things a little more and, and wasn't fighting as focused, as disciplined. That's not to say Magny didn't do good things. I think just here's what the problem was for Martin. And then when you clinch with someone so tall, so much taller than you, this is a former lightweight versus a pretty big welterweight. Uh, first of all, if they get a whizzer on you, if you're trying to pressure them and they, they whizzer on you, uh, that's really tough because if you're trying to change bubbles and get to the leg or anything involving you being lower down, <laughs> that's super tough because if they cinch up that whizzer, your arm is a lot higher than you want it to be because you know their arm is a lot higher than you. So that's already a difficult situation to be in. Clinching with tall people sucks um, unless you, you know, get double underhooks and you can body lock them, then it's nice. Uh, and changing levels on tall people is nice, but being locked up with your arms high with them being taller than you in, in a position that they're probably better than you in in the first place, that's not going to work out. So sorry. Sorry to Tony Martin, Anthony Rocco Martin. And uh, yeah, Neil Magny's still hanging around. He's doing the thing. Okay. Aljamain Sterling. Uh, in the last podcast and in the article, I talked about all the different looks that Sterling gives for his entries to wrestle. This kind of the evolution of his wrestle boxing game overall, wrestle striking game overall. And I also noted that Corey Sandhagen sometimes sees scrambling and, you know, leg passing and funk rolling and all that jazz. He sees that as his first line of defense, so he can just strike at will freely. And then if you enter on him into a grappling situation, he said, okay, I'm, I'm funk rolling, I'm doing whatever, I'm turning my back, and I'm, you know, creating a scramble. And that, that kind of bypasses any other defense. So if you're Aljamain Sterling and you don't get the best entry, it's no big deal because he's going to start grappling with you, you know, at will. That was my read on the fight beforehand. That's not really how it played out. And the thing that surprised me pleasantly the most was that Sterling clearly knew his best look is pressuring and that wrestling on the cage is somewhere he can really excel. Um, <clears throat> we've seen it a few times from him against Henan Burrell was one of the best times that he you know, really stuck to it, stuck to being a pressure cage grass, uh, wrestling type of guy. And you know, his entries were more enthusiastic than technical. There was definitely volume and a lot of different looks involved, but some of the, the entries, the strikes he was entering off were a little reckless. Uh, you know, like turning his back and doing reverse elbows and things like that. Uh, just getting crazy. Uh, there's a reason for it. He was trying to get Burrell to throw back at him so he could duck under and get to his hips easier, which is smart. But you, you still run the risk of doing something stupid. He's pretty durable, though, so no big deal there. But against like Cody Stamen, for example, it was a little more measured and he was really mixing up his lead hand a lot. So he's shown a couple of different ways of pressuring people to the fence and finding his timing to enter on the cage. And then when he's on the cage, like I said, long people, tall people, they're really hard to clinch with, especially in those positions. And uh, he used his length pretty well once they got to the cage. So what he did was he came out pressuring and didn't, I don't think he threw a punch. <laughs> I think he came out kicking and, and fainting and hit fainting and you know fainting punches and Sandhagen took the back foot because he was pressuring super hard right out the gate and uh, they were kicking and Sandhagen kicked back with him so a lot of the time to stop someone from kicking with you from stopping that range from being as effective for them you also kick so you can say I also have something to offer you from this range I think that was a smart read by Sandha uh, by Sterling rather in his camp to Sarah Longo, I think maybe they saw that in an earlier fight that Sandhagen was a pretty willing kicker and he'd, he'd throw back. So they came out pressure and kicking. It's also just a cage cutting tool. So if Sandhagen did try to circle out laterally, he'd be able to round kick to, to cut off his e exit and chop at him. But yeah, Sandhagen kicked back. Sterling caught the kick, which again, I don't think that's the best consistent look for takedown entries, kick catching, because you're lowering your arm on the side that they're kicking you which could go super badly if you don't see the kick coming enough to know what level it's coming at, or if you don't smother the kick to make sure it can't get to your head because you're in front of it. But he caught the kick, and he, he uh, went head outside and drove to the cage, and then he slid up off the leg and dug a super deep underhook, and he was really punching this underhook 
he's leaning in on his right side and he's flaring his elbow and he's reaching his arm up and swimming his arm up diagonally. And that's forcing Sandhagen to bend over. And on the other side, Aljamain Sterling was grabbing his wrist and pulling it across his body. He was pulling Sandhagen's wrist across his body. Uh, when you watch Russians wrestle, uh, you probably saw uh, Islam Makhachev do this to uh, Chase Saldati in, at the, in the AKA room. They called it like, I think the YouTube video was like the Russian snap down or, or whatever they want to call it. Uh, the Russian arm drag, I don't know. But it's just misdirection, uh, redirection rather. You're snapping them down and you're pulling the wrist across their body. Yeah, their, their shoulder is going to turn in, their body's going to turn in, and you're taking them out of their base by snapping them down. It's going to work better. Um, so here you have Sterling punching him all the way one way with the underhook and pulling his wrist the other way. It's turning his body and making him give up his back. It was really brilliant. And we noted that Sandhagen was pretty willing to give up his back when people clinch with him and, and put him in that precarious situation. He said, I think I'd rather give up my back and have a more stable situation with rear standing and be able to peel hands or do whatever than try to get out of this position. He likes to keep things moving, keep things flowing. So that was another great read by Sterling. And yeah, basically as soon as Sandhagen gave up rear standing, it was over. Uh, Sterling hopped up and uh, got seatbelt grip and, and put the choke in as they fell down. And it, it was just readjusting for the choke after that. But Sterling did everything right, <laughs> right away. He did all the right things. Uh, he executed on all of his reads. And I did talk to uh, Sean Madden, who is uh, one of Corey Sandhagen's coaches, and he wasn't making any excuses, and there wasn't anything that they weren't prepared for. I think it was just you know, some other stuff going on with Sandhagen. Uh, I'm not going to disclose. There's nothing crazy, but uh, it, it, he didn't really remark on anything technically that they weren't prepared for or conceptually that they weren't prepared for. Um, but that was a super impressive performance. I think uh, it's pretty clear that in terms of wins, uh, Sterling is the number one guy in the division. I love Peter Jan. I think uh, skill-wise, Peter Jan's the best guy in the division, but he really only has the Rivera win under his belt at this point. I mean, like, the other ones are impressive as far as contenders that I care about. Rivera's his only win, whereas Sterling has a good number under his belt at this point. So that's the number one guy, uh, unofficial champion, and hopefully, hopefully, I'm sorry, all my, my auto stands, I am one, but hopefully Jan beats beats Aldo so we get the number one and number two guy in the division fighting for the title which is how it should have been all along Henry Cejudo but I get that they weren't paying you and you didn't think it was worth it to fight those guys I understand but yeah Aljamain Sterling really really impressive uh, I'm glad I wrote about him beforehand now I look smart uh, Garbrandt and Asuncao covered it Nunez Spencer not gonna talk about it <laughs> so that's that um let's do Let's do listener questions. Yeah, okay. I have, I have a decent amount, not as many as last time, but they're all pretty good. I, I only didn't answer a couple of the ones that, that were asked of me. So here we go. Dan Albert, my boy. He's asking, any myths or misconceptions that I want to dispel about wrestling in general or within the context of combat sports? You know what, Dan? You know, there is something pretty major that I want to talk about in terms of misconceptions. And I don't think anyone listening to this podcast has this problem. But it's just a good thing to spread moving forward. Just, you know, really basic, really basic ideas. People talk about wrestling as one thing. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, he's a good wrestler. This guy's not a good wrestler. Or he's a better wrestler. Um, that can sometimes be true if they're better at everything or enough things within wrestling to be better. But it's not, it's not so binary. There's so many different aspects to it. I spent that entire article on Sterling just talking about his entries. There's his finishes beyond that. There's his clinch game beyond that. There's his top game beyond that. That's wrestling. And there's so much that goes into it. Um, and then I, didn't, I could have broken it down even further because I said just his single leg entries versus just his double leg entries. There's so many nuances. Um, it's like saying, oh, he's a better boxer. Like, yeah, you, that, that could be true, but there might, you can, you know, categorize things. It's more complex than that. You know that. So when, when you see people talking in those binary terms, I would like you to correct them if possible. Uh, that'd be nice. And just, uh, I think that's, that's part of what we're doing here. Although I really only talk about neutral work 
like getting from standing to wrestling. Uh, but that's like, that's step one, right? <laughs> Once I feel like I have nothing left to cover in terms of neutral, then maybe I'll talk about mat wrestling, which is something I, I like, but it takes more time to break down in my opinion. And Ryan is so much more passionate about it than I am. I really want Ryan doing it, but maybe I'll have him on soon and he'll talk about some mat wrestling stuff. Um, I'm the mat wrestler, so really I should be talking about it more, but it's less relevant in MMA, I think than getting the takedowns in the first place. That's more relevant to most fighters. Thank you, Dan. That's a really good question. I, that, that's been weighing on me. Okay. Next one is uh, Kiran Singh. And he says, kind of an odd one, but what can you see BJJ artists doing to effectively counter or exploit the current MMA wrestling meta? Cool. Great question. This is right up uh, Christian's alley, the Karth, my boy, Raiden Reynolds. He didn't give me a question, but this is kind of like a question he's asked before. Like, basically, what what can you do to anti-wrestle? You said BJJ artists, which leads me to believe you want ideas that are grappling-based in terms of countering the, the MMA meta. Um, a, a very uneducated answer on my part would might be, well, let, let's think about the ways people like to wrestle. They like to pressure to the cage, and they like to get doubles in the cage. They like to control from rear standing when you stand up stuff like that so maybe being good at countering uh the rear standing position like maybe being a uh a kimura a kimura from you know submissive back control guy get some sakuraba techniques in your under your belt that could be something i don't like that's a thing that you should be doing a lot because you should probably just be trying to peel hands and break uh but you know if you just want a grappling answer <laughs> to a couple of things um but overall i would say that not just bjj artists but everybody if they want to counter or, or exploit the wrestling meta, I think they just need to be better strikers. Because striking is what allows you to get to your entries, and being a bad striker, or having bad ring craft or bad footwork, is what gets you entered on and taken down in the first place. Now there's people who have all of that, and then you can just touch their legs, and then they're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and you can take them down. Well, that's not very common in the UFC at higher levels and good divisions. So most of the time it's about not having opportune entries, happening uh so a couple things there one would be ring craft specifically not being pressured being hard to pressure this is going to be an annoying answer but if you look at aldo if you look at Jose aldo he was really hard to pressure he didn't give up ground very easily and if you tried to push into his range he was going to counter you he was going to jab you he was going to knee you he was going to slip offline and pivot you know now you're the other way and he's out of the out of the, you know out of cage range stuff like that i mean that that's beautiful another thing is to intercept level changes and i don't mean being conor mcgregor and timing knees to like counter takedowns or jorge masvidal counter flying knees uh countering takedowns not like that well yeah that is an example but that's pretty low percentage i mean just like using tools that will discourage level changing and discourage you know aggressively changing space linearly uh, so like front snap kicks, uh, push kicks a little less so because push kicks are easier to catch than snap kicks, uh, like teeps and, and push kicks, but those work too. Just I think snap kicks might be actually a little more relevant in this case. Uh, jabbing, jabbing to the body, straights, straights to the body. Basically any level changing strike is good. Um, basically any body shot is going to be nice because if you lower your level and you throw a straight, then you're, you know, putting a barrier between you. If you lower your level and you throw, you know, round, if you throw hooks or uppercuts, then you're digging under hooks. Essentially, if they if they drive in, that's an underhook waiting to happen. So level change intercepting strikes are, are pretty good. I think I tossed this idea around in the Discord. I think I'll eventually write at least one anti-wrestling for MMA article about somebody. I was thinking Pedro Munoz, and I don't know for sure if, uh, if he has a game that... Uh, works for that but i know he throws front snap kicks i know he's you know a good grappler so i think we'll see something there i haven't looked into it yet but hopefully uh, you'll see more more answers to your question and he's got a great guillotine so maybe we'll see something there too thank you kieran this one's from my friend tegan we went to college together there's two questions from my college friends here so that would be nice uh we trained together i mean for four years so he knows me pretty well although i you know 
I, I probably still am, but I definitely was very bad at the time. I might be better now, but I was pretty bad. I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. I hadn't really done my studying yet, so definitely worse. However, there was one thing that was still there about me is I still have my money, my money takedown. And he, he got this wrong, but he said, was your ankle pick actually any good? Or was I just too lazy to defend it because it bending over is hard? He's like 6'2", 6'3", and I'm 5'7", so it's a bit of a mismatch, height-wise. But uh, it was not an ankle pick, it was a, a swing single. Basically, that's uh, like you're pivoting on your lead foot and swinging to the outside and hitting your knee, basically hitting your penetration's knee pound next to their leg on the outside, if that makes sense, like a swing, like a, like a C motion. Um, but yeah, you hit that little swing, you level change, uh, and you, you hook your arm to hit the leg, and where you go from there is, is anybody's business. Jordan Oliver's got a really good one in wrestling. Zahid Valencia's got a really good one in wrestling. A lot of, uh, you know, finesse and agility-based people are good at these, and I'm Mr. Don't Take Low Leg Attacks in MMA, but, you know, that's my, that's my move. But the, the answer to the question is both. It is both because mine is good and that you are lazy, my entry was good. I have a really fast entry on it, but at the time I wasn't very good at finishing it. It was also because you're like tall and big, a lot bigger than me. So it was hard for me to uh, collect the leg and stand with it, which is how I would finish it. Instead, I was still on my knees trying to feed my other arm through to pick the ankle on the other side and, and cover up, or just a limp arm out and get to, uh, get to turtle, get to referees, which is not something I was really able to do at the time, but yeah, that, that was basically the, the major dynamic. But yeah, you just not really knowing what to do other than wizarding was helpful. <laughs> For sure. That's a good question. Uh, Andrew A., he's uh, he's Russian. I think he really likes uh, Siakov. So we're, we're boys then. He says, uh, thoughts on Movsvar Ivloyev. I think I said that right. To be honest, he's, he's a Bantamweight contender, by the way. And he was a M1 champion. I think at the end of weight, he's got overall, you know, a competent game. Doesn't seem to have any major holes in his game. I watched him. I watched his debut fight, I believe, and didn't see the linkage so much. You know, he's like he, was, you know, he got takedowns. He was kicking. He was punching. He's doing everything, but I didn't really see the a clear linkage, and he didn't seem to be super dynamic, and that always troubles me. Uh, moving forward, being you know pretty good at everything only gets you so far. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on him and seeing if there's any, you know, advanced high-level meta going on with this game, but I don't think there is. But thanks for that question, Andrew. I know you you love all your Russian boys. Right, this one is from Hero Polycorn, which is uh, not somebody I know, but it's a good question. He said, it's universally accepted that the head pin and cage position, so basically pressing someone up against the cage with your head, and probably an underhook. Uh, that position frees up your hands when talking about working the body from the infight. So why do we not see more two-on-ones, Russian ties, which is the same thing as a two-on-one, etc., from these positions when the biggest drawback is requiring both hands offensively? Oh, I see. So he's saying, you know, the biggest drawback to a two-on-one is it takes both of your hands but when you're pinning someone on the cage with your head, the, the whole thing is supposed to be that it frees up your hands. I would say that it only frees up one hand. <laughs> I don't really see it being a thing. If you're like pressing against somebody like very straight on, like chest to chest against the cage, and I got my head underneath your chin and have you pinned there, I highly doubt I can keep anyone good or strong there with just my head. I, I would need at least an underhook on one side. So that's probably why. Um, is there anything stopping you from going head pin and two on one anyway? Like just as, as the first position? No, but what are you going to do off the two on one? You're going to drop to the leg. Sure. That's good. Um, or you're going to strike off of it also good, or you can, you know, try to trip or throw off of it, which is harder. Um, but yeah, I think a two on one against the cage is not as great just because, the whole thing with a two-on-one is you can really torque the shoulder and, and turn somebody off and create an angle, and creating angles is harder against the cage. Um, but I could see you, like, turning somebody and getting closer to their back. But then once you're doing that, then you have nothing happening on the other side because you're only on one arm on one side. So you basically gave them an escape. 
from the cage position, so I don't really see that as super relevant to the meta. Um, but yeah, I'll keep thinking about that. It's a good question. Uh, Seth Patera, my buddy, my, my good buddy, asks, when is the next episode of Wrestling Comrades? So before this podcast, it was just me and Seth talking about international freestyle wrestling comrades. We did like six, five, six episodes. They're pretty good. It's a lot of Seth talking about results of things, which is very important if you want to know results of things. Um, Problem is things haven't been happening because of, you know, the global pandemic. So we haven't had any events to cover, Uh, but we're going to be back soon. We'll be back soon. We're going to do a commentary, like an alternate commentary, over some non-copyright applicable event, probably something Russian, and we're going to talk about it, and then it'll be back. So, Seth, that is the answer. You know that. Um, But when? Probably like a couple weeks, because I am going on vacation in like a day. Cool. Thanks, Seth. This question is from Miguel, who is a Discord patron he's in the discord server and he's just generally a cool guy knows a lot about boxing and always like listens to my stuff and tells me how good it is and i really appreciate that because i love to be complimented he said what are examples of guys in mma with really good front headlock games i think this is just a setup i think he's setting me up to be able to talk about chad mendez so let me start with chad mendez Uh, chad mendez has a really good front headlock game in wrestling he was really good at snapping people down and threatening go-behinds. Oh, we talked about this too. This actually links into another question. Uh, Matt Joya, staff member, asked about the, like the chin strap and if that's applicable to MMA. Basically, if you're in front headlock on someone, they're underneath you, their head's under your chest, you reach under, under their face. And if you're in, a, in an MMA and a BJJ context, you're going to go around their neck, right? The difference is with the chin strap is you go on their chin, literally. Uh, This is like breaking into the the grappling meta a little bit. He said uh, Josh Hinger, Hinger, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, has been doing it uh, basically because you can be on the chin strap and then, you know, lock up for a guillotine or you can, you know, use it to control the head and uh, pass, things like that. I, I would say that's very niche (laughs) that's very specific uh in wrestling i think everyone would prefer to be on the neck just because it's a it's a greater control position you can do a lot more yanking and torquing and so if you're chad mendez you can be on the neck and then have uh the control outside the arm like an arm and guillotine type position just from from uh from front headlock still basically you can like rip him one way and then circle out and hit your go behind the other way but he was really good at getting people to react and reach their arms out to try to stop the go behind and then uh, underhooking the arm and hitting a cement mixer, basically rolling them through like a like an unconnected anaconda type motion, motion if you're just a grappling guy. But he's really good at that. And then in MMA, he was really excellent at, you know, being super crushing and strong from front headlock. But as soon as he was in those positions, he would break it, you know, keep one hand on the collar and start uppercutting or striking off of it. And obviously he had that guillotine. So Chad Mendes has really good front headlock. Obviously Tony Ferguson, you know, utilizes snap downs, which is something people don't really do in MMA as much because it's not as easy to get to. And uh, really good at sinking in chokes and, and weaving his arms through. So Tony Ferguson for sure. And uh, Alex Perez, just really super strong from that position and a good variety of knowledge of chokes. That can make a big difference. I'll think of one more. Mike Brown. Mike Brown was very good from front headlock, and what was beautiful is he would do two things. He'd be in front headlock, you know, be strong, doing his thing, and he would go uh, head in the hole, which basically means you, like if I have my right arm gripping the head or neck, and my left arm on the arm, take my, the right side of my hip, start turning that in toward the mat, and then walking my feet out to the left, while crunching down that front headlock position. So I have my head pinning their shoulder on the left side and I'm walking my feet out there. It's really hard to resist that motion because you know, you're know you controlling their, their head and arm uh, and you're walking yourself towards their back. And 
you can basically just get yourself all the way towards their back <laughs> without much resistance and you could theoretically choke somebody like that with your head with your uh, yeah with your head against the shoulder so that was really awesome so he would do that and then he would get to the back and then he would actually while he was still in like referee's position he would reach back around for a guillotine type grip for an arm in type grip and uh start to circle back and and hop over for a peruvian necktie so that was really sweet um, so good uh, back front headlock dynamic there from Mike Brown. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Theo Binst says, who are the great old school wrestlers who would have made a great transition to MMA? Um, well, here's the thing is there aren't that many great old school wrestlers <laughs> in, in my estimation, at least. Uh, but I have seen footage of a few that really impressed me. I mean, the one that everyone's going to say is Karelin. Uh, has the most Olympic and world gold medals in Greco history. He's a heavyweight, super crazy strong, popularized the Karelin lift, which is a, a parterre motion. So once you already have the takedown, essentially, and you're in, you're on their back, if you were looking at it from a grappling standpoint, uh, the Karelin lift is basically turning into a uh, more of a front headlock positioning, um, reaching and, and locking up tight, tight waists, you know, under their belly, standing with that, and then back arching and throwing them over your shoulder, which is a crazy thing to do to somebody, and especially crazy to do to heavyweights. So Corellin, I just assume, would have been a monster. Um, Bruce Baumgartner, similar era. Uh, Bruce Baumgartner is probably the most decorated heavyweight in freestyle. He's an American. He uh, coached at Edinburgh after that. Um, he was amazing, and just by virtue of being really good, I'm sure he would have been good in MMA. Uh, one really specific example is another heavyweight for some reason. Really, just the heavyweights are sticking out to me. Um, this guy Sherwin Thorson, and I know it's uh, no one knows who that is, but I watched the, like the 1960 whatever NCAA's, and he actually really stuck out to me as someone who was a uh, like an athlete out of time, like just way too good of an athlete for the 60s to be wrestling heavyweight <laughs> for Iowa. I believe he went on to play in the NFL or play football or in some in some capacity. But yeah, Sherwin Thorson. And I posted a video of him, so if you just go on Twitter and look up his name, you'll probably find what I posted from him. Uh, all heavyweights, that answer. There you go, Theo. Jake Holsberg, another one of my friends from college. I would say Jake is more of my coach. Because he, uh, he's from, from down in Houston and has an amateur boxing and MMA background. I think he's undefeated in, in MMA. As an amateur, he hasn't fought in a while, but I think he will soon. Yeah, but Jake's cool. He's starting a podcast and everything. He, he's in this space. Uh, but yeah, he was my striking coach a little bit for the couple of years that I was at at, um, <clears throat> at Pitt with him. But he is asking about overhands to singles, how p fighters prefer to throw them, uh, the distance they prefer, what are they looking for in the reaction, stuff like that. Overhand to single, I have a hard time with just because I think singles from space are iffy and overhands are usually from space, right? Uh, but if you think about it, if we're in a closed stance matchup and I throw my overhand, I'm level changing and I am level changed in front of you. My right hand is high, but my left hand is probably low. My left hand is lined up with my lead leg if we're uh, orthodox closed stance together. And I, I, I could probably, you know, faint that motion and then reshoot I kind of pump back out on my left side and get to my uh my high C entry off that that might be really nice uh or you could just you know overhand and drop right down to your snatch single that'd be cool too uh if you're Zach Makovsky or somebody like that you could always circle them out and lift them and, and dump them which would be pretty sweet um what are they looking for in the reaction I think just to, to get a high guard I think bringing up the high guard is is the goal when you're doing any sort of explosive attack into a takedown. Uh, so that would be good. And preferred distance just enough that you can touch the leg at, at the extension of the overhand, I think would be smart. That's a good question, Jake. I changed my mind about it as I was explaining it. Cool. Uh, Joe Mayall. Mayall? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. He does, uh, he does breakdowns for the body lock. And I've read them. And they're good. You should read them. He does grappling breakdowns, I believe. Anyway, Joe asks, what are the pros and cons of leg-based shots versus clinch-based takedowns? Is one better for MMA? 
And the last time I asked her questions, he asked about Fedor. And I think Fedor said that judo is a better base, is, is better for MMA than wrestling because of the same reason. So first I have to clear up that wrestling is wrestling and upper body and throws are, and leg attacks are all wrestling. <laughs> so just because someone's a wrestler doesn't mean they're just going to take leg attacks or just if they're judo. Well, if they are judo, they are only going to do upper body. But you know what I'm saying. Wrestlers can do it all if they're good. But most of the time they take leg attacks, so that's just more available in MMA. And they're higher percentage to get to as far as entries and, and so on. But I mean, there are pure upper body artists in freestyle, in folk style, and obviously in Greco. So I'll clear that up first. Uh, but the pros and cons of leg-based shots versus clinch-based ta base takedowns, the entries are totally different. Uh, I would say entering on a leg attack is riskier because you have to change levels and put yourself underneath somebody. And if you fail, you could lose a position or it could just be really taxing to get out of that situation or you could eat a level change intercepting strike. That would suck. Or if you're doing a clinch entry, you might have to punch yourself in a range, which is a different range than a leg attack. Uh, and it's a more of a committed striking entry. It's not as much of a lie as a leg attack is. You actually have to get into that that exchange in, in earnest. Uh, also reactively, if you're like Formiga, you're gonna you know, dip under their strike and left hook your way into the collar tie or into the underhook or something like that. Uh, you're waiting on them, which is really dangerous. Um, and then once you're in those situations, you know, finishing a clinch-based takedown, uh, there's actually a higher risk then of you ending up in a bad position if you fail the throw, if you fail the trip, if they trip you, if they throw you. Uh, more of a risk than if you're, you know, taking out the base leg on, on a single leg lift. You know what I mean? Or if you're doubling against the cage, there's less risk there. So I would say those are those are pretty big differences. Um, and then against the cage, you know, if you're on a leg attack, you're bent over, it's harder. If you're just clinching against the cage, it's more of a resting position. It's not a resting position, but it's more of one. Uh, but yeah, is one better for MMA? No, it totally depends on the way that you strike and what you're comfortable with and what your skill set is and what your preferred attacks are. Um, both can work, just you have to know when you're doing which and why and have a game around it to make it work. So thanks, Joe. Finally got to that. Uh, okay. Okay. This is from Juiced to the Gills, which is a great name, and I believe uh, we've only interacted through these these threads. So here we go. He asked this last time, and I didn't answer it because I'm a jerk, so we're going to do it again. Uh, are there any technical reasons that Kyle Dake always has David Taylor's number? Similar with Burroughs and Dake. Why does Burroughs always have his number? Is that likely to change this Olympic qualifier? Basically, just talk about Dake, and I'll love you. Well... Here I am talking about Dake, so I hope you love me. Uh, if you don't watch college or freestyle wrestling, Kyle Dake was a four-time NCAA champion for Cornell, and he moved up in weight every year, which is, he's the only one to ever do that, and he did not take a redshirt season, so the first year he was in college, he won the national title, and so on, and I believe he did not lose after his freshman year at all. So, historic wrestling figure, one of the all-time greats in college. And then in freestyle, he failed to make the world or olympic team five or six times whatever it was almost all of them against jordan burroughs and then once against Jaden cox and he moved up in weight which was ill-advised because that was a huge jump in weight from 74 kilograms to 86 kilograms which is massive <laughs> so that's that's what happened there and with burroughs and dake Basically, the style with Dake is that he has his good leg attacks. He's pretty slick with his entries. He's a good hand fighter. He's tough. He's competent everywhere. Um, but he is a bit reactionary, and he can scramble his ass off. But at the same time, sometimes he does wait on people, and uh, he's not great at generating his own offense. And he takes his low stance, and uh, his leg attacks are not the most explosive. They're not elite, I wouldn't say. He's very explosive, but just his leg attacks aren't very uh, driving. And when you're wrestling Jordan Burroughs, you need to be able to have that kind of physical presence to deal with him if you're going to be in your low stance, hand fighting with him, holding ground with him. Uh, so that was one issue. The other one is that he's you know such a strong upper body wrestler. It was really hard to pummel in on Burroughs. And uh, if you're going to aggressively hand fight with him, Burroughs is a really crazy good hand fighter. So then he's having more time to snap you down and take you out of position and find his leg attacks. So I'd say those factors contributed 
that Burroughs can take. And I also think just maybe maturity, you know, physical maturity. Burroughs is always, you know, the man, and, and Dake was, you know, strong as hell and obviously very athletic, but still coming up uh, out of college and recovering from injuries and trying to, you know, make his way and, and figure out freestyle. Um, that was another thing. He, he wasn't as good with his counters, his freestyle-based counters, like, you know, cross lifts and, and chest wraps as he is now. Uh, but yeah, they had that rivalry, and then Dake moved up to 79 kilograms, where he was only opposed by basically Alex Deringer, and he beat him every time. And then Dake won two world championships at 79 kilograms, so Dake's right up there, pound for pound now. Whereas Burroughs has may maybe lost a step, probably not. I mean, he ran into Sietikov, who is pound for pound number one by some people's estimation, or number two under Sajulayev who hasn't lost or anything, so it's not like anything bumped him out of contention. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that's the deal with those two. And then David Taylor is a two-time NCAA champion um, for Penn State. He got pinned by Bubba Jenkins his, uh, his first trip to the finals, and he lost to Kyle Dake, his other trip to the finals that he didn't win. Uh, Kyle Dake has beat David Taylor six, seven times. A lot of times. He has never... He never won. <laughs> and I think David Taylor's game can pretty much be summarized as heavy snaps, heavy snaps, heavy snaps, uh, ankle pick. And that's that's the gist of it. And then obviously once he's riding and once he's off his snap down game, there's cradles, there's go behinds, there's other rides, there's tilts. There's a lot that comes out of it, but that's the uh, the general approach. And I would say that just with, with Dake, him and Dake, they had two similar styles for Taylor not to be better than him in those areas. You know, he had a more consistent process with getting to his leg attacks, but he wasn't a better hand fighter. He wasn't bigger. He wasn't stronger. Uh, he was bigger, but he wasn't that much bigger. <laughs> and uh, they, they're both, you know, excellent mat wrestlers, but Dake's defense, Dake's scrambling was always, just, it, it was simply a level above, I'd say, is, is a really reductive way of summarizing that. Um, so, you know, he could ride him for, for longer. His mat returns were excellent. And, you know, Taylor, as great a scrambler as he was, he's not as good on bottom as he is on top. And that's where Dake could really exploit him, whereas Dake was very well-rounded in that defensively and offensively on the mat. Uh, he's probably the best in the country. So that was just a tough matchup for him, I think. And then in freestyle, I mean, Dake was always better suited to freestyle than David Taylor. Uh, you know, huge upper body throw type of guy, huge counters off leg attacks, huge counters off of upper body entries. Uh, he pinned him once in, in freestyle, so it's in the, at the 2012 trials. Um, so I think that it was just a matchup thing, not that Dake's objectively better. Um, now, obviously, David Taylor has a world championship at 86 kilograms. Um, yeah, those two probably will never meet again, which is sad. Um, yeah, but in terms of Burroughs and Dake, this Olympic qualifier... Burroughs took a loss to Isaiah Martinez, man. I think that's that's telling. Um, maybe he was just having an off day at Final X when he lost to Imar, but that happened. So I think you, you have to say that Burroughs is, is feeling his age a little bit. He's been competing nonstop for a long time. Uh, I mean, 2016 was was a bit of a, a meltdown. Not not that he lost to Godoya. That's totally reasonable to lose to Godoya, but just that that slide afterward where he lost to, to Beksad. After Rachmanov, who's doing MMA now, by the way, um, that he he got tech fault. <laughs> he got 10 tech fault, and he didn't really wrestle that match. He wasn't there. He, he kind of gave up, which is not characteristic of Jordan Burroughs. It's so unlike him. He's one of the grittiest, toughest, like ridiculously gritty wrestlers you'll ever see. I mean, all of his matches look like a fight, all of them, and he is dog tough. It's crazy, but he broke after that Godoy have lost. He didn't want to be there anymore. He said it himself, so... You gotta wonder what's up with him. He, he's had really great performances since then, but he's had so many matches where he's had to claw his way out of a hole to win. I mean, his first match at the World Championships last year, uh, 2019, against, um, shoot, it's a Belarusian, it's a, it's a Russia to Belarus transfer, and I wrote about it, Nurikov, Azamat Nurikov. Uh, he wrestled a really stupid match, unfortunately, against Nurikov, where he just kept shooting low into this chest trap, and it's, it's in the head pinch. That's Nurikov's best counter. Um, and he did show a couple of good looks. I wrote the article about how he re redirected him 
uh, with the hand fight and shot side on and completely avoided it, which was awesome. I loved that. But just inconsistency with the decision making, maybe it's ego, I don't know what. It's also a thing that people have been scouting him for a long time and his game is very uh, straightforward. He has a couple tools he likes. So people say, oh, I can shut that down and uh, I can beat Jordan Burroughs. And sometimes that's true, but obviously he's elite in every area and you have to be that kind of guy to beat him. So I, I think Burroughs might have lost a step. And I think Dake having really good chest wrap counters now and definitely a, an interplay between his chest wraps and his uh, crotch lifts. Uh, he'll start with a chest wrap and then once you flatten out, basically if you shoot it, shoot in on somebody and they lock underneath your chest and sit to their butt, they're threatening that if you try to, you know, base up, like get your hips up and finish that on them, he's going to kick back on that and try to take you over and expose you for, for points. Um, so a lot of the time when someone has a tight chest trap, which Dick does, they'll flatten out and they'll try to stalemate the position. They'll just, they'll just hang out there until it's over. But what Dick does is he'll threaten the chest trap, and then once you do that, he'll base up and he'll go in and pass and he'll reach back and he'll lock through your leg lock through your crotch and and start to lift from there and and mix up the position so i think his new comfortability with those positions is going to be tough for burrows i think his size that he put on is going to be tough i think he's just the guy who's coming up right now um just based on who they are as people (laughs) i definitely want burrows to win the series but uh it's possible it's possible that dick wins and i'd probably pick him just for those reasons I stated. Not because anything in their past matches shows me that, that Dake is coming for him, but just the, the changes that Dake is making, I think bode well for that matchup. That was a really good question. Thank you, Juice the Gills. I'm sorry I didn't answer it last time, but I got it now. Cool. Couple more, couple more. This, <laughs> this question is from a Sun Sao is God, which is just a fantastic name. I hope that's not a Sri Ram burner but it might be. We'll see. What are the possible reasons why strikers like Jermaine Durandamy and Anthony Pettis seem to have not improved their wrestling for about the last seven years? That is harsh, man. Well, I would say those are dissimilar cases. So GDR, I don't, I just don't think she learned how to wrestle. I think it's that simple. And uh, you think that's a crazy thing to say? But you, you hear stories from these camps where like, yeah, this guy just did not participate or work hard or really want to be at wrestling or grappling practice. Pat Barry is like that. I've heard that about Megan Anderson. It's it's a thing. It's a thing. So I think it's that simple for GDR. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Anthony Pettis. I think Anthony Pettis's issue has always been ring craft rather than wrestling. Um, because, you know, between... His WC days, to the Clay Guida fight, to the Gilbert Melendez fight, just for examples. I think his base wrestling competency did get better. If you watch him against Eddie Alvarez, for example, he's really good at getting off the cage and not being taken down and uh, you know, reducing Alvarez's efficacy as a wrestler and you know, beating him in clinch situations. I think he's a decent wrestler, just base. It's just his ring craft, his game is not really conducive to not being wrestled because he's not that good off the back foot. If you're going to be a guy who wants to be an outfighter and people pressure you, you better have an answer to that. Um, I think Pettis as a pressure fighter always should have been the move just to you know mitigate those issues, but it's really hard to change somebody that late into their career, and, and Rufus Sport doesn't seem to be the best tactical gym. Tyron Woodley. So, you know, I, I would say that might be the reason. But yeah, if, you're, if you're just getting consistently put on the cage... Even if you're really good against the cage or as a wrestler, like if you're Rafael uh, Dos Anjos, it, it doesn't matter if you keep getting put against the cage. Eventually, they'll get you. Or you'll just lose because you were against the cage the whole time, even if you're doing better in those situations. By the way, uh, Dos Anjos beat Covington. <laughs> the quick explanation is even though Covington had him against the cage all that time, if you look at what's happening, it's Dos Anjos beating him up. So look into it. Next question. Oh, that was good, by the way, since I was God. So I hope I uh, did you proud and, and pandered to your interests, if you're sure um, And then I, I put in the Covington thing. This one is from Tactical Brick 25 I don't think I know you, but thank you for, for questioning. You asked, uh, who are some tall, lanky boys who have great defensive wrestling? That's a good question. 
I consider myself lanky, but I'm, you know, I'm lanky for like a flyweight, <laughs> not for a normal human. So people who are normal sized humans that are, that are good defensive wrestlers who are lanky, John Jones, I would say is lanky and, and pretty good defensively. He can be taken down to open space by, you know, Gus, <laughs> but, but otherwise, uh, I think he's pretty tough just because, like I said with Nagney, if you're tall and you whizzer on somebody, they are tall now. It's really hard to leg attack somebody when you're tall. It's that simple. Max Holloway, really, really good at bringing people up off their shots with, with whizzers. He's a lanky boy. Um, yeah, I, I think just overall being tall and, and having long limbs is beneficial in MMA for defensive wrestling. If you're against the cage, for example, and you get side on in your stance and get really wide like that, it's really tough to, you know, clamp the legs together to double. Singles are still there, but even then, if you, you know, bring somebody's leg up, if you're not as tall as them, as them or taller, then it's less of a, a burden on their base if, if you lift their leg up. So, yeah, it's really hard to wrestle tall people in MMA, unless their stance sucks, in which case it's really easy to wrestle them because their legs are so close together. Um, yeah, so that's helpful. Thank you for the question. Last one. This question is from uh, Camilo De La Rosa, who is a Discord patron, I believe. He's not around too much, but I think he's like an overall, like all-round fan, not, not from any specific discipline. He might have some boxing knowledge. A lot of our patrons are boxing people, and I like do not know how to talk to them because I don't watch boxing. But here we are. Camilo asks, maybe a dumb question. Absolutely not. Not dumb. But is there any benefit to MMA fighters training pure wrestling, or should anyone using wrestling for MMA always combine their wrestling sessions with submissions and such? I would say no. I would say they should not always do that. It, it does benefit to train pure wrestling, um, because there's just so much to learn in terms of base skill competency. You should really be dedicating large stretches of time to just learning wrestling stuff. You know, just limp linking out of half a single, just learning how to run your feet on a double, just learning how to turn the corner, just learning how to do all these things. I mean, there's so much to do. There's so much to learn. Um, so for time efficiency, yeah, maybe mixing things makes sense, but I think it would pay off more to just get really good at wrestling in itself and, and to wrestle. Um, and the guys that I am really impressed by in MMA are the people that look like they just flat out know how to wrestle. It's actually pretty rare. And when you see it happening, you're like, oh yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. And it just provides more depth when you have these exchanges. You know what you're doing more, and, and you ha you can bail yourself out a little bit more. Uh, being a good scrambler, basically, to I answered this last time, being a good scrambler basically just means that you have a lot of knowledge of a lot of different positions, and you're pretty comfortable going from one to the next. And it also you know requires you to have a great gas tank to keep moving through those positions, but that's what it is. Um, and that's a huge benefit in MMA to, to keep moving through positions and not having to be stuck in one place because being, being stuck in one place can be a fight ender. Um, now, do I think, I think they should also train to know what the differences are when they're in MMA specific situations, but I think just to start out in, in, you know, supplementary, you should train pure wrestling guests. And I think they should train freestyle and I think they should train folk style and I think they should train Greco. I think they should do it all. Um, which is a huge time commitment, but if they can afford to take the time to just do wrestling, I, would, I think it's a great idea. Cool. Okay. Those were really excellent questions. Uh, like I said, I'm going on vacation, so I might not have an episode next week. That's why this one's kind of late. I figured I'd give it to you slightly in between, and <laughs> maybe that would be helpful. Uh, let's just take a look at, at this weekend's card coming up here. Um, June 13th. Cynthia Calvillo versus Jessica I. Now there is there is a main event we deserve. Yeah, as people for watching MMA, this this is what we deserve. I'm just kidding. No one deserves this. This is cruel. But just looking at that card, if there's anything interesting to talk about, not <laughs> not really at first glance in terms of wrestling. Uh, I think Mark De La Rosa and, and Jordan Espinosa, they'll, they'll probably wrestle. They're flyweights. I mean, they're bantamweights, but I think they're former flyweights. flyweights so that'll happen. Uh, Andre Feely is, is a longtime Team Alpha male guy, so I think he's always got a double in his pocket like he did against Sadiq Yusuf. So maybe there'll be something there. Uh, Marab, 
Rob D- Davalashvili, the Georgian. He uh, he's not a wrestler. He's a sambo player, but he can wrestle, obviously, and he does it at very high volume. And uh, I'd like to see him get a pressure game. I think if Aljo can do it, that means the coaches know that it's helpful to do. So I am hoping they can get a pressure game out of him because if you're going to be wrestling constantly, you should do it against the cage so you don't get disengaged and get tired. Um, yeah, he was going to fight somebody. He's going to fight Ray Borg, which is going to be interesting because Ray Borg's a pretty confident scrambler. Although uh, Casey Kenny gave him a bit of an issue. He pretty much held his own with him, so I'd be interested to see how that went, but he pulled out. So, he is fighting uh, Gustavo Lopez, I want to say. Did I make that up? Gustavo Lopez, who's a uh, Combati Americas champ. And he, uh, he punched good. That's all I know about him. So, maybe he's good. I don't know. So, hopefully we see some, some cool stuff from Marab. Maybe I'll talk about it. I don't think I've ever talked about Marab in any structured sense before. And that's it. <laughs> that's the card. Curtis Blades will be fighting the week after that, so we can talk about that. And uh, Clay Guida. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> Roosevelt Roberts. There's somebody. There will be some there's some wrestling to talk about next time after that, but we'll see. We'll see what I do. But yeah. Thanks for listening again, if you do listen. And I hope the questions were good and and the answers were good and the breakdown was good. And I hope that you guys are doing okay. The world is is pretty nuts overall, all the time, but especially now because, you know, the global pandemic and civil unrest in the United States and extending to other countries. Um, If you're protesting, I hope you're being safe. If you're not protesting, I hope you're helping in some other way. If you don't think that's necessary, I think we should talk about that because I disagree. And yeah, I think that's it. So I'll talk to you guys whenever I talk to you. And I'm speaking to like 100 people right now. But, you know, I love you all. So see you next time.